Thanks. Thank you, Frox and Anapur, for having me here today. It's a real honour to be here in my favourite city in the world as well. And Zoe mentioned the reference genome for Candida auris, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, this kind of happened by accident. I was doing a fellowship on something completely different, and around about the start of this year, we got contacted by some very scared and worried clinicians saying, we've got this outbreak. Um, of this pathogen and we don't know what to do and we're kind of hoping that you can do some sort of genetic epidemiology approach to kind of help uh, trace where it's come from and kind of help us manage um, this outbreak. So I'm going to touch a little bit on how MinIron has helped us and kind of our hopes and dreams for how this is all uh, panned out. Um, so Overview, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of Candida auris and fungal infections in general because I appreciate that not everyone knows a lot about fungi. People tend to know a lot about bacteria and viruses, but fungi are a little bit unusual. Um, and how we've used MinIron sequencing, firstly to generate a reference genome, that was our main aim, um, but then also we had some big hopes and dreams to see if MinIron could be used for resistance profiling as well. Um, so, this outbreak occurred in an NHS England hospital. Um, you may have heard that it was in London. Um, but in general, fungal infections are a massive threat to human health. Over one million people die annually from them. Um, and resistance to antifungal medications is on the rise. So the main frontline drugs for fungal infections are a class called azoles. And they're called azoles because of their chemical structure. And um, much like the antibiotic resistance problem, we're having a similar problem for antifungals as well, primarily because there's no new drugs being made. There is a new class of drugs that were approved for use last year, and we're already starting to see resistance to those drugs as well. So we've got a similar problem in the fungal field as well. And they're particularly deadly in people with weakened immune systems, so people with HIV AIDS, those who've had uh, solid organ transplants, or cystic fibrosis patients can be lumped in as well because they have excess mucus production and um, they can't clear infections that they breathe in. So Cryptococcus is a big one in, oh dear, sorry. Cryptococcus is a big one in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in HIV AIDS populations. Candida albicans is probably one that you may have heard of. Um, and Aspergillus fungi is actually a Western problem. Um, it's primarily a problem in cystic fibrosis patients and those who've had a, a lung transplant, and it's a massive problem in the UK and uh, US as well. So this is what Candida auris looks like, it's a photo from the CDC. It, it's, it's just sort of white, opaque colonies, very indistinguishable from other fungal species, other yeasts such as Cryptococcus. So in terms of just looking at it on a plate, we can't really tell what species it is. So we then need to go into more speciation type molecular methods. Over the summer, a new fungal infection hit the headlines. It was on the Guardian website and also on the BBC as well. And I put new in inverted commas because it isn't really new. Um, it was first discovered in 2009 in the ear canal of a Japanese patient, never been seen before. And since then, it's kind of made its way across the globe, causing isolated cases in South Korea, India, South Africa, a few cases in South America as well. But in April last year, we um, had our first case in the UK, just one. Someone had it on their skin that didn't have an actual uh, clinical symptoms of a candida infection. But since then, we just had this massive outbreak and it's still ongoing. This is a graph that goes up to July this year. And um, basically, we're actually now into the numbers of like the 80s now. And this is the world's largest outbreak of this particular candida species. And um, quite frankly, it's scary. Um, all of the isolates that we tested are resistant to a particular drug called fluconazole. So kind of remind, I'm relying on you to remember that I said azoles just a few slides ago. So flu, all these are azole drugs. And they're all resistant to fluconazole. 
They're also showing resistance to other azole drugs as well, showing that it's multi-drug resistant. What's particularly interesting is that half of the ones tested are resistant to this drug here, posiconazole, and this resistance hasn't actually been seen in any of the other isolates that have been isolated across the globe, so this is brand new. Um, this is particularly worrying because these people are already in hospital because they're sick, and they're acquiring this infection in hospital, and the death rate is about 66%. It's not great. So um, we, the NHS has this very policy-driven approach to diagnosing disease, and it's got, it's got three terms. You've got a blood culture positive, you can have um, sort of a, a culture positive skin, or oropharynx, or a vascular line, um, but they might not show clinical signs of candida. But then you can also go get inv invasive candidiasis, where they have raised inflammatory markers, and they're shown some sort of response to antifungal treatment. And they have this quite laborious process as well um, of all these different experiments. They, they culture on solid media, and um, typically candida albicans takes about 48 hours to show on solid media. The, some of the ones that we're culturing, after five days, there's still nothing growing. It's actually really slow growing. They speciate by, by mold it off, which is quite routine. They then do drug susceptibility testing using a microbroth dilution test. And because it's so new, there's not really a typing method to kind of try and put these isolates into context geographically with other isolates to try and figure out where it's come from. So there isn't anything like MLST available for this, although I know Public Health England are trying to get that up and running. Um, but AFLP worked quite well for us, um, and we um, found that this UK outbreak um, was, was, was from South Africa originally, um, from AFLP. But all of these together, you know, this is a long time to do all of this. And we were thinking, wow, wouldn't it be really nice if one day we could just do one test that would tell us all of this in one go in a matter of perhaps days instead of this taking potentially two weeks? Um, because this at the moment is really eating into diagnosis time. It's really making the difference of life and death for patients as well. And it costs a heck of a lot of money. So when we were first approached, um, we hadn't really got a clue what to do with this. So we, um, what, what's the first thing you do when you know you want to do min-iron sequencing and to generate a reference genome, but you're not quite sure how to do this on a yeast? You call Nick Lohman, and you go, Nick, what do I do? And he goes, it's fine, Joe, it's fine. This is what you do. So um, we came up with this plan and, uh, to generate a gold standard reference genome, um, basically combining a luminous short read technology and the long reads of MinIron. So this is back using R7 chemistry. Um, and we picked one isolate that seemed to be relatively quick growing. Um, and MinIron sequenced that using two flow cells to bulk up the data for 48 hours. We sent that isolate off for uh, sequencing with Illumina Nextera using the Microbes NG service. And then we could combine those reads to get our gold standard reference assembly. Um, and it was. It was quite tricky to do this because the, the yeast actually has a really tough cell wall. So we had to use bead beating to get the, alumina, uh, the DNA for the alumina sequencing, but the DNA was so fragmented we couldn't use that for the min-iron. So then we had to ha optimize our DNA protocol again in order to get decent quality DNA for the min-iron sequencing. So this actually took quite a bit of, of faffing, really, and also liquid culture as well, which the NHS really didn't like, because liquid culture means that you're more prone to contaminating your environment. If you spill your liquid culture, that's it. That's your entire room cordoned off and it has to be deep cleaned. We played around with uh, incubation times as well. We really wanted to try and do sort of like five days to try and get enough DNA. But if we're thinking downstream in terms of diagnosis, if we want to do this more routinely, five days is too long. 24 hours meant that we didn't get enough DNA. So 48 hours is actually a nice happy medium with this. 
So this, this all turned out actually really well. Um, and for this particular isolate, we, with the R7 chemistry, um, I know we've had a little bit of a who's read is longest during this, conf during this conference. And um, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I mean, I, I was quite happy with this. I mean, for a yeast, I thought that was okay. And we got a massive amount of data. And um, I it was really chuffed to get this, this um, reference genome. Um, and I had 157 contigs, which um, for a genome which is just under 13 megabases was really good. And, you know, 157 contigs, you might not think that's great, but we've used PacBio on other fungal species, and we've had something like 4,000 contigs because it's so fragmented. So this was a, this was a dream, really. And at some point during this whole uh, experiment, the CDC got wind of what we were doing. And uh, they were like, we want to we help, we want to pitch in. We're like, yeah, yeah, sure. So they'd, um, so they'd actually sequenced a few isolates from around the world using Illumina. So we were like, okay. So we'll sequence some of our uh, isolates using Illumina as well. And we can align them back to our reference genome. And this is another point I want to make about the MinION. We sent our sequences off for Illumina to a core facility. And 16 weeks later, we were still waiting. And we were like, this is an outbreak, guys. We, want, we need the data yesterday, you know? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we're on it, we're on it. So we finally got the data. We finally got the data. And I thought, wow, I could have sequenced this, you know, like multiple times over with a MinION. And um, we, we, we aligned the Illumina reads back to the reference and produced this lovely phylogeny. And um, we included the original Japanese isolates, some from South America. These are the South African isolates. These are our UK isolates here in the blue. Um, our UK isolates are from India or Pakistan, we think. Which well, looks pretty close to India or Pakistan. Definitely not from South Africa, which is what the AFLP told us. So AFLP isn't worth the paper it's written on, really. Um, and uh, the amount of SNPs differing from South Africa to our, in, to our UK outbreak is astonishing. And we can see that our outbreak is incredibly closely related to each other. So we were really um, pleased with this. What was really astonishing, though, was we went back to our patient zero. The pa patient zero had not been to India. They weren't Indian. They, they, you know, they, were, they were British. They hadn't picked this up from India. So it has been imported into the country from India. We're just not quite sure how. We may have an idea, but not quite sure yet. So looking at the UK outbreak on its own, um, doing SNP analysis, we actually think that there potentially may have been multiple introductions into patients, and it's kind of lingered in the environment of the hospital, and, um, and, and that's basically what's happened with our UK outbreak, but this is, I'm not gonna go too much into that, I wanna concentrate on the use of MinION technology. Um, so resistance profiling, when we started this, we, we thought, it's not, we're, not, we're not gonna do it, you know, fungi, the genome's too big, we won't be able to do it. Um, and, it's, and it's only recently since the, the new chemistry's come out that we've been able to really think actually it might be possible. Um, so we started with the R7 chemistry and um, then moved on to the R9. And literally before I came out here at the start of the week, I managed to get something using the 9.4 and I didn't have time to put it on the slide. So that's gonna be very anecdotal. Um, but we were really chuffed with the fact that um, we were able to get some sort of resistance profiling going on. So this is um, back to our phylogeny, and you can see that uh, there's a certain single nucleotide polymorphism in a particular gene that confers resistance to fluconazole, which is the one that all the isolates have resistance to, if you remember. And they're geographically distinct. So the South African isolates have this particular mutation, which causes an amino acid change. Um, the Indian ones have this, this other, other one. And then some of the Indian ones and all of our UK ones have this particular Y132F1. And some of the Venezuelan ones do as well. So we wanted to see as a proof of concept whether we could actually pick this up. And we couldn't with the R7 or even the R9, but this week with the R9.4, we could. So that's really good. Um, and we got it within the first 24 hours. So if we wanted to do this just for the sake of resistance profiling, we only needed to run it for 24 hours and we get enough data acquisition in order to profile the resistance available. Um, 
the positron is all resistance is a little bit tricky because we don't actually know what the resistance mutation is. So we need to find that out first. But there is the potential that we can do this really rapidly now. So just to summarize, I hope I've made it clear that fungal infections are just as an important threat to humans as bacteria and viruses are as well. The long reads from the MINI and sequencer have enabled the creation of this gold standard reference. Um, and it was perfect for our outbreak, really. But um, also, I haven't really spoken about uh, species identification. And I think with the amount of data acquisition the MinIron is now creating, going back to that approach that the NHS has to speciate, uh, to do a drug profiling, and also then typing in terms of geographical context, you could actually do away with all of that. And the idea of actually having a bedside tool in a hospital setting is actually becoming a real possibility. And it's the MinIron. Because in terms of capital outlay, it, it's, it's really cost effective. And we are actually really, really close to implementing this in an NHS hospital. And we can actually do a personalized drug profile for people who present with an infection. And we can say, OK, you're resistant to drugs X, Y, and Z. We're going to put you on a different class of drugs. This improves patient survival rates. It means they're spending less time in hospital. It means the NHS isn't spending all this time on different protocols and different experiments. They've only got to do one experiment, and they're getting all this data from it. The only problem is it requires a massive policy change, which is where the politics come into it. But the balls are rolling. So we think that you know it, 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 they can't ignore that this is a good thing, right? Finally, I'd really like to acknowledge um, my mentor, Matt Fisher. He's the first mycologist Imperial since Fleming. So this is, this is a, he's, he's a great man. Um, and Darius first presented this problem to us back in the, the start of the year and introduced the very, very worried clinician, Silke, Silke Schlenz. Um, and Ali has been incredible with helping with mycological identification. Um, but thank you, ONT. You've been a great, great partner to work with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Do we have any questions? One just over here. Thank you. Have you performed uh, your pro procedure on the raw sample without culture? Because the sample you use the liquid culture. Have you performed the procedure on the raw sample without culture? Oh, uh, no. No. But, but with culture, there may be some selection. Uh, what if the passenger uh, is a mixture of uh, several? Yes. So actually, that's what I should have said. So in terms of, sort of a species identification, it would be great now if we could actually move away from isolating candida from the patient and saying, OK, yeah, yeah, they've got candida, let's sequence it. It would be great if we could actually just take a sample and go, let's just sequence everything. Because the data, the data acquisition that we can get now, can, we can do that. And we should be able to get sufficient coverage to confidently call the drug resistance mutations as well. So yeah. Um, could you elaborate a bit more about the DNA isolation? Uh, yeah. For the so for the MinIron, um, we, we basically use a kit called uh, the MasterPure kit from Epicenter, and we've, we've used that before um, for Cryptococcus, which has been pretty good at breaking day in the cell wall. And um, we've kind of adjusted that slightly um, because it, it includes a lot of centrifugation steps, a lot of pipetting steps, which obviously you know, shears the DNA a little bit more. So basically, the, the, in, a, in a nutshell, the idea is to keep it super cold as much as possible and um, try not to centrifuge and, and uh, shear it uh, that way. But um, I can talk to you afterwards about it if you want because it's quite, it's quite an intense process. Um, but yeah, we've hacked it apart and it's... Thank you. It's beautiful. Thank <laughs> no, you. <yeah. laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.